I started writing songs as a hobby and um, I worked at a record store. And so I, I listened to every freaking record that I was ever made. And I was so into, you know, the music when the music changed over, you know, starting in 55, 56, when Elvis came along and, and you know, when rock around the clock and the music went from, you know, from what it used to be to, to um, uh, rock and roll. And, so it was for me. It was Buddy Holly and the Crick, uh, Buddy Holly and the Crickets, and uh, and the Everly Brothers. Those were like the two acts that just made me want to write on a guitar. And uh, so I started writing some songs as a hobby. And um, at one point, somebody said, "Why don't you put those things together on a on a tape?" At those at that point it was you know the old reel to reel tapes. And I sent it to a publishing company and. Make a long story short, I wound up um, making a record with a friend of mine. Um, her name was Carol Connors, and we did a record, and it got on the radio here in Los Angeles. And Lou Adler, who was, um, mm. you know, mm -hmm. one, of, one of the, the, you know, the really uh, giants of the industry, beginning anyway, of what was happening on the West Coast, um, heard the record on the air, and he signed me as a songwriter to the company. So that was like the beginning for me. And uh, um, he put me with another writer by the name of Phil Sloan, P.F. Sloan, and mm -hmm. it just took off. You know, we the first few records we started to uh, write, you know, we had some really big hits. And um, that was the start. And before I knew it, what, what happened was that um, our company, Lou, Lou um, eventually we started at Screen Gems, Columbia Music. And then Lou left and took Sloan and I and my wife Julie with him. Um, it wasn't my wife at the time, but she was the secretary. So we started this company called Dunhill Records. And mm. within a year or so, um, because of the Mamas and Papas and Barry, uh, uh, Barry Maguire's Eve of Destruction and some of the songs that we were writing was also a publishing company. We became one of the hottest little companies in the in the business. We also had the grassroots, and you know that, that actually Sloan and I were the were the original grassroots. Anyway, so it just all exploded, and it started to happen. And then at one point, we were so we got so big that we were bought by a major label, which was ABC Records out of New York. And uh, things got at that point. Lou Adler left the label. Um, he went to start old records and only, unfortunately, wound up recording Carol King's album of Tapestry as his first project there. And Lou was amazing. So, but uh, I was still under contract and Lou told me, I'm going to be now in charge of the A&R at the label. I'm going to take his job. I said, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I'm a songwriter. Uh, you know, I co-produced a couple of things, but that was about it. Mm -hmm. But... Um, Anyway, the first two acts I signed, I got lucky. The first two acts I signed were, were uh, Steppenwolf and Three Dog Night. And so now we're, you know. Yeah, no big deal. No big deal. Yeah, well, Steppenwolf so, and Three Dog Night. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, we we're, were, were so hot that ABC decided that they were going to put the West Coast um, people in charge of all of the of ABC label. And and so that meant instead of having 10 or 12 or 13 artists that we had on Dunhill, I was now and the, I was becoming the head of A&R for the label. Uh, so now I had about 40 acts that I had to deal with. And it was too much. I told Jay Lasker, who's the president of the company now on the West Coast and now the overall company, I need more producers. I need more songwriters if we're going to make this happen. So um, one of the guys, I guess, Gary Katz sent a letter to the company saying he was looking for a job as a song, as a producer. And he was from the East Coast. And Jay asked me, do you want to meet this guy? I said, yeah, but, you know, bring him out. Let, let's see what, you know, what he's all about. So Gary Katz came out here. We had a great meeting because we were both into baseball and music and whatever. And he told me he has these two songwriters that um, he thinks – would make, you know, would be great for us to sign. And I said, great, let's, let's hear them bring, you know, bring them out. And that of course was Walter and, and Donald. And, um, you know, at the time they were, he was working with them. I think at that time they were still doing, um, they were still part of Jay and the Americans, you know, the, the band. Mm -hmm. And so that was, you know, that was the beginning. Once I heard um, these, 
these once they came out, they played me a bunch of songs. And afterwards, I met with Gary, and Gary said, "What you know? What do you think?" And Gary will tell you if you you know if you talk to him that I said I think they'll be the biggest act since the Beatles. <laughs> Gary Gary said that, and I said I couldn't have said that because first of all, you know I don't know if I ever believed that. Um, and all I was thinking is that they were going to be they were going to be songwriters, you know. And I thought they were great. I love their music, and I love the fact that it was you know jazzy kind of rock and roll and. They were very into jazz because we discussed some of our favorite artists. One of their favorite artists was Mel Torme. And that was, you, know, you never heard a rock group talk about Mel Torme as being one of their favorite artists. So I knew they were, they were into jazz. But um, so, again, I'll, I'll make this as short as I can. So we signed them. We Sorry. have time. So if you want to elaborate, this is a fun place to elaborate. All right, so we signed them as songwriters. I mean, you probably all know this story anyway. And... Um, and the first few songs that they gave, which I thought were all hits, uh, I played for just about every act on the label, and nobody got it. It was like, you know, too weird, too too different. You know, I don't understand the words. I, I mean, even Dirty Work, which I thought was like the simplest, you know, uh, verse, chorus mm -hmm. hit I've ever heard. Um, anyway, uh, at the end of the day, I met with them again. I met with Cats. I said, well, why don't you guys just, you know, get some musicians and become a band, do your own thing. Cause I, I know that these songs are great and, you know, maybe you should be doing them. And so that's how it kind of started. They would, we, we look for the, the best musicians around in town and, um, you know, they put together the band and they were rehearsing. They would rehearse every night in the office and we would come in in the morning and clean up. And, um, and basically, you know, that's how it all began. Who, by the way, when we first met them, when they first came in, mm -hmm. um, I have to say, in all honesty, you know, they're a little scary. Uh, <laughs> everybody, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll tell you. Here's a funny story. It won't mean anything because nobody's going to know these names. I'll explain it. At, at about this time, there was um, some kind of a, a, I don't know, a murder that went on couple of guys from college um, and then a movie was done about them. I think they were called Leopold and Loeb, two, two guys, Leopold and Loeb. And they had, and it was found out that they murdered some guys. They, these were college kids and whatever, very bright college kids. And at one point, because, <laughs> because Donald and Walter were so scary when they came in, we nicknamed them. We said, hey, Leopold and Loeb is in the studio. They're working right now. We all knew what we were talking about. Um, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, it was funny because even when we first discussed, you know, when I first met with them, they had good sense of humor, but they were, you know, they were really, you know, very strange in that. And even when it came time to talk about them going out on tour, you know, I remember Donald saying, you know, nobody's going to want to see us, you know, on tour. You know, it's just, we're not going to do that. And Jay Lasker, that was the president of the company, said, hey, you got hit records now. you got to do that. So that was that was always a battle in terms of how that would work. And Donald, I don't think Donald ever even liked his voice, you know, because he um, kept looking for somebody else to do the vocals. And, and I remember at one point saying to him, man, your voice is the sound. You've got to, you know, you've got to sing the leads. So that was always something that would, that would be going on with them. But, um, yeah, it, it was... Uh, they were strange guys. Yeah, I thought it was hilarious. I could see that they're dark and and moody. And here you have Dad, who's always making jokes. Oh and yeah, you know, <laughs> it, he'd lighten it up, right? I think that's why oh. they also worked very well in the studio for yeah. so long, is because he he would be like the icebreaker if it got really tense. He'd tell some stupid pun or something. <laughs> I, my dad was addicted to puns, I, and I can't oh. remember any of them. Well, Jesus, my, my wife and I remember them all. I mean, oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, and yeah. Any, uh, I think the one he would always use is, uh, um, uh, oh yeah, when we'd order lunch or something, you know, he would say, you know, you can tune a guitar, you can tune a ukulele, but you can't tune a fish. That was a big one. <laughs> that he loved anytime I would order a tuna fish sandwich. 
But he had a pun for absolutely everything. He was the king of puns, without question. 